Welcome. You're watching Harmony and Diversity, and today we're speaking with Steve Khan. He's an office bearer with the Australian Association of Pakistani Christians. Thanks for coming in, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noam, for asking me. Now, you're, <coughs> um, you're a Christian. Uh, you were, were you born a Christian? Yes, I was born in a Christian family, mm. although my grandparents were of some other religion, and they converted into Christianity. Okay, right. And how long were you in Pakistan for? Well, I stayed in Pakistan for almost 19, 20 years. 19, 20 years. And then you came out to Australia via the Middle East, didn't you? Yeah, I was working in the Gulf, and uh, from there we went to England, mm -hmm. and from then England, so we, we migrated to Australia. Mm -hmm. And are there a lot of Pakistani Christians in Australia? What would be the... Yeah, they are. Yeah, there are quite a few families. Mm. At least I know close to about 40, mm. 40, 45 families mm. Mm. within Melbourne mm. who are uh, from Pakistan. Right. And do you congregate at a particular church or you just spread throughout the Christian community? We do, but recently we have been blessed that we have been given a church mm. by the Anglican Diocese in Kuyong, okay. where we meet. Uh, every third third week of the month mm -hmm. it's a proper church building mm -hmm. we've been given we really have been blessed and we meet there every third week over there and uh, people come and worship over there oh good in and we do service in our own language okay oh, in, excellent. yeah mm -hmm. in urdu language we sing songs in urdu and we do all over there oh, and people good. are really very sort of blessed because they can find the same atmosphere what they had behind yes so the same thing over there worshiping in their own language so we really have been very we're fortunate with that. Yeah, that's that's a, a very powerful social community issue. Mm. Oh, speaking. it definitely it is. is, your own is language. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the Australian uh, Association of Pakistani Christians, uh, how did that arise? Well, that came in, um, in was in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, who, the, our president, Dr. Barbara Peters, he was the one who initiated this because there were so many sufferings of the Christians in Pakistan. Mm. And we wanted to highlight that, make the Australian government aware of all the, all the sufferings and what's happening over there, and then find remedies to it as well. So that's how the association was formed. Mm -hmm. and, and your interest in it, uh, how come you joined it? My interest came into it in March this year, mm -hmm. when we had an instance in Lahore, Pakistan, when the whole colony consisting of about 180 houses were burnt down mm. just on a small altercation between two boys and that altercation turned into a blasphemy thing saying that people have been talking against religion and all and everything and then there was a big mob who congre congregated somewhere about say half an hour from that joseph colony they made all the plans over there there's a mob of close to about two or three three thousand people they walked from there all the way, so the police couldn't stop them. But what the police did was that they, they had the whole of the colony eva evacuated. Yes. They took everything, uh, all the men, people living over there, they took away. And then by the time those guys came, they burned, the, they took all furniture, every white goods, other things, all out, burnt houses, and then they were dancing around that and all the thing like that. Mm. So then we said, look, we have to do something about it. So then... I met uh, Dr. Peters and then we, we discussed that what we do. So we had to create some sort of awareness amongst the people and as we are living in Australia, so we had to start from here. So that's how I joined the association. Right. And then we had um, a peaceful demonstration on the 30th of May, highlighting the same issue, what happened over there. So that's how I came associated with the association. Well, how big, how big is the membership of the association? 
Well, at the moment, we haven't got a very big membership, but uh, we should have close to about 40 or 50 families mm. who are members. Yeah, that's, so it's a fair size. Uh, so this church that you have been fortunate enough to, uh, to acquire, the families that go there, uh, do, do the events in, in uh, Pakistan against Christians, how does that affect the mood? Are there people within the congregation who are connected to Pakistan and so are disturbed and upset by what's happening there? Oh yeah, look, people do feel very upset. But the unfortunate part over there is that not many people are that bold and outspoken to come out. Okay. Considering the fact that they still have got some family members there in Pakistan as well. So mm. the repercussions might be on them over there yes. if they do something as well. Mm. But otherwise, look, all people are very, at times they're even angry that what's mm. happening over there. Mm. But Christians being in such a small number over there in Pakistan with very little resources, mm. so they, they can't do much over there. No. Although number means that there are, I think, uh, close to about three and a half or four, four million people in, in Pakistan who are Christians. Right. It's a, yeah, it's a fair, fair number. Fair number mm. of people, yeah, mm. over mm. there. Yeah, so, so the, you say that the association's purpose is to, to raise these, these issues with the powers that be. You do demonstrations. What else, what are the other pathways that you use? Well, recently what happened is there was another instance of um, a church bombing in Peshawar. Mm. So for that particular thing, we again did, a, it was not a demonstration as such, but we did carry um, a public vigil. Mm. It was right in front of the Flinders Street station on the Princess Bridge. So just to highlight the fact that look and then everyone who was there, they burnt candles and we held candles and all and just to remember all the dead people over there right. who have been victims of this uh, suicide bombing. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing we did for that. The other thing we did was that we did held um, a fundraising dinner mm -hmm. recently on the 30th of November it was. We were trying to raise some funds in order to send it to the people over there. We've been particularly because over there in Pakistan the male member of the family is the only earning hand yes and and so to speak he is the, if he's not there mm -hmm. the whole of the family has to suffer yes because there's no social security there's no centrelink as we have over here over there so mm -hmm. that's the only source of income so many families over there in the peshawar church bombing have lost their male or the main person who was the breadwinner for okay. the family mm -hmm. so we have raised some funds and we're trying to raise some more funds in order to do whatever we can from here. So maybe well, every drop in the ocean counts yeah, as help. they say. Yeah, that's the same with time. It seconds drop in and it becomes a minute. We've run that's out That's right, yep. Yeah. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Harmony and Diversity, and we're speaking with Steve Khan. And Steve's an office bearer of the Australian Association of Pakistani Christians. Steve, we were speaking about some of the the attacks which have occurred against uh, Christians in Pakistan. Yep. Yep. They have a, a, a an outcome which is more than just the physical violence and the d damage of property. You were saying about the the Joseph Colony attack. Yeah, definitely we do have because our culture and the old traditions are still very prevalent over there. Mm. Now what happens over there is that particularly the mothers who got daughters, they over a period of time just kept saving some money in order to make a dowry for their daughters. Because over there, if you don't have any dowry, so your daughter can't be, can't be married. So these women, particularly from the Joseph colony, they had all their belongings burnt out. Each and every house out of the 180 houses were burnt. So nothing was left behind at all. And for them, life was very difficult. They said that, how could you marry our daughters? They'll be sitting over here for the rest of the life now because nobody would take them without the dory and all which we had built. 
So those were the, the problems over there. And then again, they were just on, I mean, there were people who were just doing menial jobs. They were not very rich or very affluent people. Mm -hmm. So they had the day-to-day -day earnings, which they had saved some money. Maybe some of them were just laborers, so they earn day-to-day -day wages. Sometimes when they don't get any wages, so maybe they can use whatever they've saved from there. Yes. But with all this loss, it's life really became very hard for them. Mm. And they're mm. still asking for people for help and from various sources. People have been helping them, there's no doubt, from overseas and from within Pakistan as well. But uh, still, mm. I mean, it's a hard life for them. H how did that event uh, occur? What triggered it? Well, what the story is that there were two boys who were friends, one was a Christian and one was a Muslim friend. So the Christian guy used to run a small shop like where you come and play billiard and pool and all the sort of thing like that. And this fellow used to come over there, his friend. Mm. But then they had some altercation on I don't know what matter. And that all then that altercation was turned into a blasphemy thing that look this guy had something about the religion or about the prophet then it was escalated and it went to the local mosque mm. then the local mosque got involved in it and they were sort of preaching from their thing oh look this guy's done this and all this and then it all eventually this thing then they gathered all the people got together and although it was nothing to do with any religious or anything said or thing, it was just an issue between two boys yes but they just made it into such a big story. Which, yes. And the story also goes back over there that that was a very prime land. Mm. And there were certain people who were involved in it, certain of the big shots. Mm. They wanted that place to be emptied. Mm. So they can go out and they can use that because it was on a very prime land, that particular colony. Yes. So they also helped those people to do this, not openly, but in some shape or form. Mm. Because after that, there was no police case registered. There was nothing, and nothing has happened so far. Mm. The culprits were never hounded down, or the uh, police even didn't sort of bother. The police were watching them when they were when they were that that burning was going on. They were there, see them. They were they were witnessing everything, mm. but, but they didn't have the means to do it, or mm. they didn't want to do they it. They didn't want to one or other. It could be both ways. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, you mentioned the blasphemy laws. They're, they're, that's notorious, of course. Uh, the, the Christians fall, many Christians fall uh, under the blasphemy laws. There's much trouble for Christians. Oh, look, if you just open the Internet mm. and Google it, you'll see hundreds of them. Mm. Now the blasphemy law has almost become a joke over there for the reason that even if you've got some, something, some personal animosity with someone, you just implicate him into some sort of a blasphemy. You, you just need two other people to say that, yes, he did thing, and that's it. There's no investigation, there's no interrogation on that thing, there's nothing. He just sort of thought to be that, yes, he said it. If these people have said it, he said it. Like there's so many cases you might have seen mm. on young girls, they said that, look, they have taken the Holy Quran and they, they burned the pages and all. Yes. Now, how could somebody do that in that country when already that there's... Um, a hang sword over the heads of people already. No one would dare say anything against the religion. No mm. one would dare burn the Holy Quran like this. But they, these are just made up stories. Yes. People have got something against each other, they just come out with this thing and the thing like that. Mm. There are so many people rotting in jails mm. who have been implicated in blasphemy things. And the blasphemy law. Thing. Yeah. And the government is helpless. Mm. Helpless in the way that Blasphemy law has become like a divine law. Yes. You cannot right. even talk about it, leave alone changing it or amending it. Wasn't there a governor who was uh, assassinated um, for saying he, or he disagreed with the blasphemy law? Yes, certainly he was. Mm. He was the governor of, of Punjab. Now, a governor of Punjab is a very powerful, influential person. Mm. He's not easily accessible. But he made such a statement, he said that the blasphemy laws need to be amended. And after two or three days, he was shot. One of, one of his own security guys shot him. And people were so happy about him being shot. They said, look, he was um, a kafir or inf infidel who could make such a statement of changing the blasphemy law. So whatever has happened to him, it's good. And that person who killed him, he was a hero, hero for them. 
Mm. And all the lawyers of the country came forward and said, look, we will, we will, we will fight, fight his case for free. We won't charge you any money because he's done something which is very, very pleasing to God. So it's that sort of a thing over there. Mm. It's a mindset yes. over there that anything these people do or even talk about Islam is blasphemy now. So people are very scary even in the day-to-day -day conversation, particularly people, I mean, when kids and all go to school in the morning, the parents tell them, look, don't get involved in any argument, don't get involved in anything of the thing, because you never know that you're going to turn, uh, come back home or not even. So it's, mm. it's that sort of, say that it's mm. so vulnerable people over there, of the minorities at the moment, that they're so scared. It's rather insidious. Uh, and another insidious issue is the fact that the time creeps up and you know what it has. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Harmony and Diversity. And today we're speaking with Steve Khan, and Steve's an office bearer of the Australian Association of Pakistani Christians. Steve, in the past, we, in the past segment, we spoke about the Peshawar bombing mm -hmm. uh, in September uh, of this year. Uh, what more do you know about that? That was a fairly serious event, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it was a very serious event because whoever had planned the bombing, they'd done it at a very appropriate moment according to them because after the service, people all come out of the church and they talk to each other, they congregate and all. So they chose the right moment. Mm -hmm. So there were two guys who mm -hmm. came and then they blew themselves up and blew the other things as well. Mm -hmm. And there were so many people injured in that bombing. There's so many people killed. I was talking to a lady who just happens to be living next door to the church. Rather, the church fence is, is the wall of her backyard. Mm. And she was telling me that just about half an hour before this incident happened, she came to her backyard and she had put all her washings over there. Mm. She had washed and put all the things up there. He said after this blast which happened, it, everything in her house, her furniture and everything was all upside down. Mm. All her glasses were broken. And she says when she came into the backyard, it was even horrible to see that all clothes which you put, they were all red with blood splattered over there, pieces of flesh lying everywhere over there. One, somebody's head was lying over there as well. Arms, hands, because it just happened to be next door. Yes. So mm. he says, she of course fainted mm. there and then when she saw all this thing and mm. all. And the way she was explained to me graphic, it really felt to me that it was me who's been yes. there as well. I mean, yes. the way it was. And so many people, kids have been left orphans from mm. this thing. Both their parents have died. Mm. So many girls and boys, young girls and boys, school going have been injured in this. Because that day, there happened to be some sort of function where all these young children were involved in it. They were having a party, a barbecue, or some sort of thing like that. And there were lots of kids over there. Mm. So lots of children have been injured over there. One, we are trying to get one of the girls who was a victim over there. They already have amputated one of her legs. Yes. She's a 15, 16 year old girl. And the th she was a very bright st student of her school. And uh, we had talked to doctors and all over here and they said, look, we can save the other leg if you bring her here for treatment. Right. So we are trying our best mm. to sort of bring her out over here for treatment if we are successful. Yes. So. I mean, through the association, we are trying to do whatever is within our means, whatever possible we can do. Yes. So yes. we are doing that as well, yeah. Sounds like a very deserving case. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, you've run dinners to raise uh, money. Do you, is that what you normally do? Run dinners well, it's not normally what you yeah. do, but for this particular instance of the Peshawar yeah. bombing, um, as I said before, that uh, they don't have any other means of income. Mm -hmm. once the head of the family dies mm -hmm. or a thing, mm -hmm. so it's very difficult for them. So we, on the 30th of November, we hosted mm -hmm. a fundraising dinner for them 
and it went really very well. Mm. And we are thankful to all the people who were involved in that, particularly uh, the Anglican Diocese in Melbourne. So yes. they were very generous to, to, to give us a haul and help us in any way, whatever possible, to raise funds. And uh, so we did that. It was not our normal thing, but just this instance we raised funds. And we're also trying to hold other events and functions as well where we can generate some money for these people if Good. possible. Rather, now we, we would also have to generate some money for this girl who's coming over here mm -hmm. because uh, her mother is, care, uh, is coming as well as a carer. Yes. So we have to look after her as well, whatever yeah. time she's here for treatment. That's very worthwhile. Now, one thing which seems to be missing in this whole story of Pakistan is a thing called forgiveness. Now, I believe that you have started a, a project called Forgiveness One. But tell us about that. Right, yeah. I mean, this all came up um, not so much keeping them in view, but also the people over here as well in Australia. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of migration from different parts of the world over here. Mm. But unfortunately, the harmony and all is not there. Mm. Maybe due to one, 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 one particular race or one particular uh, religion or whatever the thing. So then we got together and I also had an initiative from somebody from Canberra to send me an email and they said, look, could you work? I mean, and they also heard of our association mm. and what we are doing is. Mm. So they said, look, could you sort of work out something on these lines, yes. which could create more harmony and mm. resilience amongst the society in general. Mm. So then we came up with this concept um, of forgive, forgive one. one. Mm. So what we are planning to do is, if it works that way, that once a year we're going to hold a particular day, the first week of March, or sorry, the, the first Saturday in March, to be celebrated as a, f a day of, of, of forgiveness. forgiveness yeah. So what we are asking people is, or rather urging people is, that on that particular day, you should forgive at least one person. It could be your wife, your sister, your mother, your brother, or whomever you got some anger with. Mm. So just forgive that one person, at least on the day. You can forgive as many people as you want, but at least one person, one. forgive them. Mm. That mm. means that the person who is forgiven, that person would be happy, and the person who, who has forgiven, they will be happy as well. Mm. So that means that whole of the population of, of, of Victoria would be happy on the day. Mm. That look, I've been forgiven, and that person has forgiven me. Yes. So that will create more sort of harmony and resilience. And also this message of forgiveness also goes to other people as well who got certain animosity, a religious animosity, not even here, even outside Australia. Yes. So we will try and give that message to them already. Already we are associated with a couple of uh, other uh, associations. This one is uh, Universal Peace Federation. Mm. It's a UNO body. So they're also trying to work in harmony with us, yes. particularly for this, for this project. So as far as we can spread peace mm. and harmony amongst the people, so I think that we would have achieved a lot if we can do this. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful objective. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the things in there, uh, one of the first people you could forgive is actually yourself in most cases. That's very true. That's very true. Steve, thank you very much for, for your time. And good luck with uh, Forgive One, because it sounds like it's, it's got a good essence to it. So let's, let's hope you can succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janom, for, for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you. And I'm sure other people who listen to this interview would also like this concept and uh, they can contact us through you mm -hmm. or through your organization. Mm -hmm. And we will be more than willing to talk to them and share ideas with them as well. Right, Steve. Thank you once again. You've been watching Harmony and Diversity. Join us again next week. Bye for now. Shanti Om Allah